life is not a summation of good and bad. Mm. It's a picture that you slowly build over time and that some of those negative experiences when you stepped into the dark actually are the threads or the mosaic or the tiles that tie something together later in your life. So I no longer try to look at pluses and minuses. I try to look at my life more in totality. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. My guest today and his wife, Susan, are the parents of six children and 14 grandchildren and live in Eagle, Idaho. They have moved 15 times in their 52 years of marriage, living in 10 states and even Germany for a few years. He is the oldest of 10 children and grew up in Seattle, Washington with a stay-at-home mother and a psychiatrist father, both who had significant influence on how he views life. He spent most of his business career raising funds domestically and internationally and, and investing funds in commercial real estate. He has written extensively to extended family and friends through the years and after encouragement from them has begun to fulfill his life dream to become a writer. I am pleased to present Paul Taylor. Paul, are you ready to share your story of hope? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. It is exciting to have you on today. It really, really is. And I thought we would break the ice by talking a little bit about the significance of your birthday. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I'm probably one of the few whose birthday actually shaped their adult life. Mm. Um, it goes back to, I was delivered on August 10th. Had my mother delivered me on August 9th or had she delivered me on August 11th, I never would have received a draft notice during the Vietnam War. Mm. And that draft notice subsequently changed and substantially changed my life path. I was married for about a year when I received that notice. I was planning to go to law school. And that draft notice then changed my life and changed my career path because I went in the Army for a while. So anyway, being born on August 10th is a significant day and it changed, it really changed my life history. Wow. And and it really, I think, boils down to God is in the details of our lives, don't you think? <laughs> yes. Uh, more and more, um, I come to realize that and accept that sometimes I don't want to accept that. Um, but I, I, I think I'm getting a little bit better realizing that, that, that God is in charge if we allow him. And if we submit. Mm, yeah, you really hit the nail on the head there. I think mm. I've, I've been actually pondering about that recently as I've been doing my scripture studies and just thinking back on my own life about the importance of learning to trust God and lean on him completely. Sometimes when a change happens, we're a little hesitant because we're like, that is not what I expected. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, sometimes when we're in the, in the heat of the moment, it's difficult to have that perspective. Mm -hmm. Two years later, three years later, four years later, five years later, we could look back and say, wow, that was not as bad as I thought it was in the heat of the moment. Um, and so in the heat of the moment, it's a little bit difficult at times, but I, I agree with you. We need to submit and he is in the details if we allow him. Yes. Absolutely. Well, we're going to talk about how God influenced your life today and was in the details of things that you probably didn't initially think was a positive thing. You thought it was something very hard. Right. Would you mind sharing that story with us? Well, I guess the, the primary one here is um, our son, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, Mark is the fifth of six children. We were expecting, uh, uh, you know, a wonderful delivery and whatever else. And Susan had gone into, she had long deliveries. And so we went into the hospital. This was uh, 
in the Chicago area. And we went into this hospital late Thursday afternoon. And Mark was finally delivered early Friday morning, about 1.30 oh. in the morning. And we were happy. The doctors were happy. They told us we had a fine son and the delivery went well. And so I spent a little bit of time with Susan and then went home to take care of the other four kids. Mm -hmm. um, and later that Friday afternoon, I got a call. Um, we didn't have caller ID, so I didn't know who was calling. And I was trying to get the four kids together into the van to go up and see mom and see Mark at the hospital. And I answered the phone and it was Susan. And I could tell immediately that something was wrong. I wasn't sure if Mark had died, um, but she, through the conversation, which I'll spare part of it now, but she basically asked me if I was alone somewhere and if not to go somewhere where I was alone. Mm. So I knew something was, was up. And mm -hmm. so I made our way up, my way upstairs to our master bedroom closet, closed the bedroom door, closed the closet door and was insulated from the kids downstairs. And Susan told me that Mark had Down syndrome. Mm. It's difficult to even now recount that story. Um, and I collapsed to the floor and I thought my life was ruined. Um, but it, I had to get up off the floor. I had to get up off the floor figuratively. I had to get up off the floor uh, physically. Um, and I came to realize within a couple of days that it was not about me, that it was about Mark. Mm -hmm. And that was the first lesson that Mark began to teach me, even though he was a couple of days old, is that it was not about me. It was about him. And it was a different relationship that was being established and I have since come to realize that that was probably outside of maybe marrying Susan, one of the most important things that ever happened in my life from an mm -hmm. eternal perspective, because what he has taught me and, and my other children, I don't mean he is my favorite. It's just he has unique talents and gifts that he, is, he shares with us and, and others around him. Mm -hmm. And he has been the most unexpected blessing in my life. Never in my life would I have thought that I would have a child with disabilities. And never would I have thought that a child with disabilities could teach me so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is a great blessing in my life. Paul was able to write an amazing book called Mark and Me. And I was blessed to be able to read it just this past week. And, and as yeah. the parent of a child with actually two children with disabilities, it so many of the things that you were talking about, I could really relate to, yeah. you know, it's amazing how much these children with special needs can change us for the better if we let it. Right. right. And so I want to kind of go back to that moment when you heard uh, that your son had down syndrome and, and ask you what gave you the strength to get up off the floor that day, because I know how that feels. And I know how devastated I was when our son, Nathan, initially got his diagnosis. Yeah. Um, I guess I would like to say that the Lord inspired me to get up, but I don't, <laughs> um, I, I think it took a couple of days for me to get to that point. I think it was, first of all, just the reality I had to get up. I didn't know what this situation foretold for the future, but I just know I had to get up. I had four other children who were waiting downstairs. And even though I was crying and on the closet floor, they were part of my responsibility as well. So I guess that the first aspect, Tamara, I just had to get up. Over the next couple of days is when I began to have, I guess, more spiritual understanding, spiritual awareness, spiritual hope um, that things would not be as bad as I thought they were in those first couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure what your experience was, and I didn't die, but I know people who have had near-death experiences talk about how their life flashes before them in just a couple of seconds. Well, much of my life flashed before me in a couple of seconds thinking about, and I, uh, how does the mind work so fast like that? Mm. Um, so 
I guess the answer is, first of all, I, I realized I had to get up. And it was then that after a couple of days that I began to have feelings of the spirit and whatever else, that things could work out. Mm -hmm. There was still a lot of struggle and a lot of issues that we had to deal with. Um, but it took a couple of days, I think, for the Lord to begin to soften my heart that things would be okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and I, I experienced something similar. I think you just kind of go through the motions yeah. for a few days, you know, physically yeah. and, and emotionally it, it takes longer. You're right. It absolutely does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, people ask me about that and I, I, again, I can only say and whatever was mentally going on in my mind or mentally was going on in your mind to some degree had to be pushed to the back part or to the rear because you had, and we have other obligations mm -hmm. and responsibilities that are equally as important. Yes. So. Absolutely. And, and I think that emotional understanding and submission, it comes little at a time as we're able to process it. Don't you think? Yes. And, and I would say, and I, again, I write about it in the book, Susan, um, in those first couple of months that, uh, after Mark was born and we were getting ready because he was going to have open heart surgery, which is another story. But she made contact with a group of women in the Chicago area where we lived at the time, who each had a child with Down syndrome, young child with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And those women played a, a significant role in shaping our approach to how to live and deal with Mark and also gave me a perspective that I had hadn't had before mm -hmm. that mark uh, the individual soul and spirit is of great worth but prior to mark my feeling a lot of times in, in associating with with other kids with disabilities was they were more a burden or whatever else these women helped me understand a true christian gospel principle that everybody has worth and it changed my perspective on how to go forward with mark and it mm -hmm. It really has shaped how we have tried to raise him. And because of that, I think he has been a significant, not because of us, but his own personality. He was able to influence so many other people for good. I, I love that. And I love how um, the power of finding a tribe of, of people, right. either who've been through something similar, or maybe who are even a year or two or five or 20 years ahead of you can give you that help and perspective of, oh, I can get through this, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, and these women, again, I'm not sure what your experience was. Our experience was there are some people, including some of his doctors, who, which was a growing number early on, who basically said, well, why do you want to, why are you so concerned? He has Down syndrome. And it, mm -hmm. I mean, the attitudes have changed a lot since the you know late eighties. Mm -hmm. but, but these these women helped us with the idea that we kept saying we're not sure that they've got the doctors or this educators have the right idea. Um, these women gave us the courage to sort of step forward with that tribe, to use your term, and sort of define what we wanted to do with Mark as opposed to what others would do with Mark. Mm. And I think that's one of the lessons we learned, which came a little bit later, but started there is to be an advocate for your child. Yeah. Only, only you can advocate for your child in the truest sense, because yeah. you know what that child needs or what you would desire for that child. And many times it's in conflict with school or doctors or whatever else, and you have to be an advocate for your child. No, oh, and I think you've hit upon something really big here that I think every parent is an advocate for their child, whether they have a disability or not. But when they have these special needs, it's especially important to stand up and stand beside your child and find what's right for them. And I know that you had quite a battle in front of you um, yeah. Why don't you share a little bit of that and how Mark was able to then influence more than just your family. His influence began to spread and it changed almost an entire school district, right? 
It, it, it did, and I can tell you a story after the fact, but we lived in the suburbs of Chicago, and it was one of the larger school districts. And at the time Mark was that age, children were not in the regular classroom, whatever term you want to use, but they had a special education situation. They would bus him there, and we mm -hmm. didn't want that. And so we basically felt the law was on our side and we then started IEP meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings and a growing cadre of people on both sides. Those who were supportive of our position and basically some people in the school district, the school administration, the school teachers who were less desirable for what we were trying to accomplish. And it was a battle, literally a battle for a couple of years. And eventually I, I had lost my job in that area and we needed to move. And just prior to moving, some of the people who, who had been vociferous in their, in their opposition to what we were trying to do, basically said to Paul and Susan, I'm paraphrasing, we apologize for the issues on the front end, but you were right. Mark has indeed changed this school and he has opened up doors that we never would have thought possible. And so thank you for what you did. Fast forward, we live in Eagle, Idaho. And a couple of years ago, I was at one of his baseball games, kind of a Special Olympics baseball game. And I was sitting in the stands and a woman who I didn't recognize came and sat down next, next to me with the people that she was visiting. And she, I asked her where she was from and she just told me what suburb in Chicago she was from. And I said, well, we used to live there. And I said, what do you do? She said, I'm a school teacher. And then she went on to tell me a little bit about how well respected that school district is for their treatment of children with disabilities. And I thought, wow. I know where it all started. <laughs> it started with that young man out there in that baseball field right now. <laughs> it, it did, but it also started with those women because we would have not been able to do that had those that tribe, those women, inspired us to do what we did. It's interesting that they probably started out just where you did, you know, maybe yeah. figuratively on a closet floor, just weeping. And yet in just a few years, they became the inspiration that helped you right. change in and, you know, plant the seed that changed an entire school district's view on special education. Yeah. You know, what, what an amazing impact. So I guess one of the big lessons to learn from here is don't underestimate the power of God and helping you become the type of person who can make amazing changes or that your child that who can impact your child to make amazing changes, you know? No, I, I would agree with that, that sometimes it's not very easy. <laughs> Never. You have, you know, either the expression <laughs> endure to the end and whatever else. But again, sometimes if we can then look back two years, three years, four years, and in this case, you know, almost 25 years or whatever else when I had the experience with the woman here in Eagle, looking back to say wow you know the scars of those years are not so significant anymore um mm -hmm. they're minor in terms of eternity but who knows what other how many other people have been influenced for good because of that experience and i know we're not the only ones many everybody you okay mm -hmm. what you're doing right now and with your children your sons are the same thing. And there are many others who deal with circumstances that you don't want to deal with, but benefit others in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess sometimes we have to just be brave and courageous and move forward with faith, yeah. right? That, that God is going to make it as it says in Romans, all turn out for our good. <laughs> you know, again, going back to quoting some of the, the people in the, in the church, advice was you have to take one step into the darkness mm. before you're able to see the light. Sometimes you can't see the full lightness of the road ahead of you. You have to have faith to take a step into the darkness. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, a, is an important 
an important lesson that it's only once you get into the darkness that you can begin to eventually move to the light. Oh, and, and that is scary. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It is always scary to take that step into the darkness. And you, in your mind, it's like, you know, God has it, but your soul is just like freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree. I, I, and there are some times when I should have stepped into the darkness and I didn't. Mm. And I look back at my life and realize that I made the wrong decision. Mm. Some, some other times I have stepped into the darkness and I can see that the benefit. But I acknowledge that there are some times I didn't step into the darkness when I should have. Mm. You know, I, I've, I've, I've started looking at that in my own life as well, Paul. Um, sometimes it takes me longer to step into the darkness. And I'm thankful God's with me on that journey wherever I am, whether I'm fast or whether I'm slow or cautious, that he's yeah. with me on that path. And he's going to say, he's going to stand by me, even if I'm not fast, <laughs> even if I'm more of the tortoise instead of the hare, yeah. you know, that, that, He's, he's like, okay, Tamara, you got this. And if it takes a month or if it takes two years, he's with me. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I'm thankful that he's patient with me because I'm doing things at my own pace and maybe I'm not as fast as I'd like to be in my mind <laughs> yeah. or I think I should be in my mind, you know, yeah. but, but he's, he's like, it's okay. I've got this. Keep going. Keep trying. And I, the older I get, the more I realize that I need to quit beating myself up for not being faster, M maybe at processing some emotions, or maybe I'm not faster at being courageously stepping into the darkness, because God knew that when he told me step into the darkness, and he knew yeah. it was going to take me longer than perhaps I thought it should. Yeah. And so to be, give myself a little grace that mm -hmm. I'm on my own journey and it's going to take me longer sometimes, you know? you know, a little bit related to that in my own mind, when I was younger and I probably still do at times now, but when I was younger, I sort of added up the negative experiences in my life and the positive experiences in my life and sort of summed them and made a judgment about my life at that point in time. Mm. But I've had enough experiences now to see that the those so-called negative experiences like mark i mean this whole thing with mark when i first you know to see the benefit and so what i've come to realize tamara at least in my own life is that life is not a summation of good and bad mm. it's a picture that you slowly build over time and that some of those negative experiences when you stepped into the dark actually are the threads or the mosaic or the tiles that tie something together later in your life. So I no longer try to look at pluses and minuses. I try to look at my life more in totality. And I mm. see the relationship between times when I stepped into the darkness and see where that led me to a, something beneficial in my life or my children's life. And then, as I said, I look back and regret sometimes, what did I miss? What did I not get prepared for back in such and such a time when I could have made a different decision? So mm. anyway, I try to look at my life a little bit more in, this, in totality as opposed to simply a linear or a summation of individual events. That's wisdom right there. <laughs> they say wisdom is experience applied or something like that. Yeah. I think you're right that the longer we're alive, the more we, we can kind of step back and see the pattern and how God had his fingers in all of it and was right. leading us and guiding us. Okay, well, when you're ready, <laughs> take that step mm -hmm. and don't worry, it will all work out. And of course, we don't know what all work out is going to mean. Eventually. Right, that's the, that's the, that's the, yeah, that if we knew that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you had an interesting experience where you didn't know how it was going to work out when you went snowmobiling. Would you mind sharing that story? Well, it, it, it was a winter camp out with Mark for Boy Scouts. And um, this is when we lived in the Seattle area. And we were going to dig snow caves. 
Um, and this was up in Mount Baker National Forest, which is in north northern Washington state. And so I forget, there were probably eight or nine scouts and I think four adult men. And we had practiced with snowshoes and everything else. And so we left on a Thursday morning. There was a school break. So we left on a Thursday morning to go Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And once we arrived at the area, it became clear. It was beautiful. I mean, the freshly fallen snow and the beautiful sunlight, all those kind of things. Very, very poetic looking but turned later into something it's really diehard scary. Uh, anyway, um, it became clear that Mark could not snowshoe very well. And so they, they took his pack and snowshoes and he and I trudged up the mountain waiting for them. And so after a while, I was beginning to be physically exhausted helping him through the snow because there were no trails. We were simply mm -hmm. all, and so, the first lesson for me on perhaps the most spiritual experiences of my life occurred when I sat down on a tree with him and the the poem Footprints in the Sand came to my mind. Mm. As I sat there, I had the realization that 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 poem where there are two people, two sets of footprints in the in the sand and one of the people who who is with the Savior wonders why at some point in time there's only a single set of footprints and the Savior lovingly tells him that I was carrying you at that time. It overpowered me. Mm. I was trying to do for Mark what the Savior was doing in that poem. And it just overwhelmed me with love, uh, both me for my son Mark, but also Heavenly Father for me. And so I was in that kind of state of mind. And we, then we little had to continue on because we had to catch up with the rest of them. Well, we were, we had lunch and then we were in some building a snow cave and Mark and I and another man were in this cave and we were under several feet of snow and we're in there and it collapsed on us. And I thought I was going to die. Um, I have no idea how long, but I know what it's like now to be buried in an avalanche. Mm. And we eventually got out of there. And to get to the point where you're really asking that at that point in time, we had to dig another snow cave. Um, and so that night, as I was laying there, I kept thinking to myself, I have to protect Mark. I have to get Mark home. Another wave overpowered me, more powerful than even the first one on the trail of, of a father's divine love. I, Tamara, I cannot describe it in words. It, it was so powerful and peaceful at the same time. It just, I just cried. I was in this snow cave crying and crying because I felt this love for my son, Mark. And then another wave came over, which basically the roles reversed, and I was now the son. And sort of figuratively speaking, a heavenly father was saying to me, I'm going to get Paul home. I'm going to get Paul safely through the night. Those three separate waves of experiencing divine love and the relationship between fathers and son or parents to children, again, I, I cannot, words fail me but they were the most powerful spiritual experiences in my life to know of divine love and what it will be like someday to feel that again. Mm, to know that God loves you so much and that he is looking out for your best interest, right? Yeah. And not only that, but he's also looking out for your son's best interest. Right. I mean, we, I literally thought we were going to die when that all caved in on us. And so I think, all of that physical exertion, that physical fear set the stage. Again, these are the bad things set the stage for me to feel those three rounds of divine love. Had I not had the physical exertion, had I not had the fear of death, all of those kinds of things, I don't think I would have been prepared to feel to the degree that I did, to the magnitude that I did, that love that the Father shared with me. Mm. That is a powerful concept. 
it's interesting as I think back on my life, the hardest moments often have precipitated the biggest blessings. Yeah. And so I guess what I would say to anybody in a hard time right now is we're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, we'll have more lessons, tips, and things you can apply to your life. Stay tuned. Are you looking for a gift for a friend, sister, or mother who is really struggling right now and you're not sure what to get them? It's hard for me to sometimes find those gifts. And so today I'm so excited to tell you about this booklet, The Mother's Might. It's a perfect, simple, inexpensive gift you can give your friends, your family, your sisters, anyone that you want to share this story with. And it will be meaningful. It's not just a little piece of candy that they eat and forget. It's something they can read over and over again because so often we, as women, feel alone and overwhelmed and burdened and like there's so many things weighing upon our shoulders. And what I love about this story is that it points us to Jesus Christ in our times of trouble, that He understands us, He loves us, He knows what we're going through, and He is more than willing to help us bear that burden. And I love that about this story, that it gives not only me hope, but it will convey that sense of hope for all of you. So get your copy of it today, tamarakanderson.com slash store. You can order one, two, 10, 20, however many you want, and we will get those to you so you can get them distributed. All right, now on to our show. What I would say to anybody in a hard time right now is... If you're struggling physically, if you're struggling emotionally, if you're, however you're struggling, that God is with you and watch for the compensating blessing coming because of the trial of the challenge. Richard G. Scott gave a talk once called Trust in God. And there's a line in that I'll paraphrase that say that the father and the son don't require any more difficulty in my life that is absolutely necessary for my eternal exaltation or for those of I, that I love. And so mm-hmm. it kind of goes along with the way you're just saying. Um, sometimes I go, well, why do I have to experience all that when somebody <laughs> else is not? But, um, but again, as I look at my life, the father and son are saying, Paul, these are experiences that you need. Mm. And I think sometimes if we're asked to trade our life situation with somebody else, we think initially that we might, but I think ultimately when the decision comes down, we would probably say no. Mm. And most, I think most, most of us would probably say no. I'll, I'll keep what I have. <laughs> yeah, I've, I think I've heard it said that trials are tailor-made, you know, and... In my life, I can say that with no pun intended. They're tailor-made. <laughs> I know, since your last name is Taylor, I was actually thinking that. <laughs> But um, it's interesting how those most difficult things really do change our perspective if we let it, because I I know that um, trials can also have, they can have a softening effect towards God, but they can also have kind of a, I'm building a wall with, you know, it's a hardening effect almost. Um, And so we get to choose how we how we approach that trial. Are we going to let it soften us? Are we going to let anger and bitterness take over? Because it ultimately is a choice. And I know that there's times that I've started out super angry and and God has patiently worked with me to calm me down and work through that anger and get rid of it and move towards becoming more soft-hearted again. Yeah. Susan and I have had two different times in our life where in essence, Mark was one, and we have a daughter, Sarah, who faced life and death circumstances, and we had to make a choice. Do we do we sort of submit mm. to a heavenly will, kind of like Abraham, mm. um, or do we not? And I can say that we got to the point with the Spirit's help that we could submit to whatever was going to happen um, and accept whatever was going to happen. And in in Mark's case, he survived open heart surgery. In our daughter Sarah's life, we had an experience early in her life where she was spared, and later on, when she died from a brain tumor. So I I can well relate to what you were just saying. Sometimes 
depending upon our feelings, how we actually sort of accept the circumstances and go forward with a, with a more thankful heart as opposed to being bitter. I can see how it's very easy to be bitter at times, especially when it comes to your children and their health and life and death circumstances. Mm -hmm. Would you mind telling me a, a little bit of Sarah's story? Because sometimes we get the miracles, like you say, that we're looking for, and sometimes we don't. And, and how did that come to be in your life? How did, how were you able to submit even when it was something like she's going to die? Yeah. Well, to put it in perspective, when we were in the Seattle area and I was getting ready to go down to graduate school and while we were traveling, Sarah, we were in a U-Haul truck and whatever else, and she became ill. And to make a long story very, very short, um, we had to stop in Burley, Idaho because she was having difficulty breathing. They transported her back to Twin Falls, Idaho, and she spent a week in intensive care. She survived and we were grateful for that. And as we were leaving, one of the doctors said, um, we wanted, want you to know that a, a force beyond us restored your daughter to life. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I'm, we're happy she, I got to get to graduate school, you know, and but about a year and a half, two years later, Susan, I, Sarah, and our oldest son, Adam, were having a discussion totally unrelated to what Sarah had experienced. And she sort of stopped us and wanted to know why we had prayed so hard. And we said, what are you talking about? Why did you pray so hard to bring me back? And we thought, what, you know, and she said, it was very nice over there. Oh. And so... Again, sorry for the emotion. But that put in perspective what the doctor said. A force beyond us restored your daughter to life. Fast forward to she's in her mid-20s. She develops a brain tumor. And she, she passes away about three years later. Um. And so in those two situations, one where life was truly, literally restored, mm -hmm. and another one where it wasn't, yet we did all the praying and fasting, you know, all kinds of things that people in faith do to help call down heavenly blessings. It was her time to go. Mm. And we had to basically accept the fact even though we wanted her to stay, her husband wanted her to stay. It was her time to go. And we had to have that same wrestle again. Could we voluntarily, spiritually place Sarah on the altar like Abraham mm -hmm. and accept whatever was going to be? And so, again, a comfort came over us during that period of time. But also, I think we are a little bit, I don't want to say neat, but maybe... In, in, with one child, we've seen where life was restored through faith and prayers and all of those kinds of things. And on the other hand, the same things were done, but life, in this case, was called home. Mm -hmm. So it's not always faith and prayer is going to bring the result that you were hoping for, but mm -hmm. faith and prayer hopefully gives you the courage and the faith, really, and the trust in God to go forward irrespective of the result. Wow. That is such a powerful experience. And it's interesting that you had it with her twice, but, right. but maybe the first time prepared you for the second time. Do you no, know what I, I mean? Really, it I, gave no, you a foundation. I, I really believe that it, it, it helped. I don't want to die, <laughs> but, ha but having watched Sarah, I'm, I'm less afraid of death. I watched her struggle for three years. Um, for the first year and a half, two years, it looked like she was going to, you know, win the battle for a while, um, or at least lengthen the, lengthen the battle. And then the last year was, I watched her slowly, slowly, slowly lose the battle. But she did it with such faith. And she inspired far more people in her final year or two. Um, it was unbelievable to me how many people's lives she touched by watching her through that struggle. And so I realized then that God is in charge, as we've been talking about. He sets the timetable. 
when it comes to life and death. Um, and that I'm less afraid of dying having watched Sarah. Mm. I like what she said. It was nice over there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they just stunned us when she said that. That's very sweet. And I think it, it also gives us hope for the resurrection, for, for that time after we die, when we'll be with family, we won't be separated from them. And it'll be nice over there, <laughs> you yeah. know? Well, you know, if I could, you know, kind of combining the experience I just talked about with my experience in the snow cave of feeling divine love, sounds a little bit facetious, but if in a way, if I could transport myself right now mm. to that existence or that realm or that feeling, uh, I would leave in a minute. Mm -hmm. Because to be associated again with those that I love, and to feel the divine love from a father in heaven and his son. Why am I hanging around here? <laughs> because we have more to learn, I no. think. <laughs> no. uh, I agree. While we're here, we've got to just keep pushing forward and doing our best and working through our problems with God's help. Someday it we will go, we'll all go home mm -hmm. and we will feel God's love for us. Now, what Bible verse have you had that has become especially meaningful to you as you've gone through these challenges in life? I, there are actually many scriptures, Tamara, but I guess one that maybe is the shortest is in Psalm that says, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's 4610. Those few words, okay, have been a lesson to me saying, Paul, be still, calm down. And again, as I've indicated before, sometimes I was not in the position or desiring to be still and know that he was God. But I have been able to look back at times then and some of those experiences. And so I think I'm a little bit better than when I was younger, that when I'm in a difficult circumstance now, I still try to push forward. Uh, there may be discouragement and so forth, but I've had enough experiences now in my life looking back to say, okay, maybe I can trust Heavenly Father in this circumstance, just like I did in that one and that one mm -hmm. and that one, and help me to get through it. Mm. Yeah, well, we all do, right? It, it's it's easy to be still when life is still and, and calm. <laughs> it's yeah. those moments when it's not so still and calm when God is reminding you and you're just like, it's really hard to be still right now, God. <laughs> It's really hard to trust you right now because my daughter is dying, you know, or, yeah, or yeah. my son is struggling and I've got to work through these challenges. So it, it is a perfect verse to remember. And, and I love how you, you pointed out that remembering has been another key thing to help you be still remembering back. Well, God got me through that situation, right? He's not going to suddenly forget me and leave me alone in this one yeah. and trusting that. So remember, well, I, I, think that, I think that's important to what you just said. Yeah, absolutely. During that period of time when Sarah was experiencing what she was experiencing, I'd lost my job in Seattle. That was one other time. Okay. Mm. I lost a lot of money. Mm. Um, and so we found ourselves in St. George, where my in-laws live, because we'd sold our house as long as we, we were in suitcases. Mm. So we had to park ourselves for a while. So we parked ourselves in St. George. And after we'd been there a couple of weeks is when Sarah's brain tumor was diagnosed. <clears throat> so wow. we spent sort of two years down there. And Daniel uh, and Mark and Daniel, our youngest son, went down there. And unbeknownst to me what future events would happen, Daniel has subsequently told me that that was some of the happiest times of his youth mm. when I was just overwhelmed. And for about a three month period of time, I took him to the, the Dixie College down there for a, a once a week computer class. Mm -hmm. He has subsequently told me that that's what started him on his career. Really? And he's very, very successful in it. He, he, he's one of those high tech companies and down in Utah right now. But I guess where I'm going with that one, it, that's a real world example to me that my son has explained that he knew how terrible 
things were going for us with Sarah and my job and the money, we all of that kind of stuff. But for him, that was a seminal event for his career path. Mm. And I'm going, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, to Daniel, thank you for sharing that because that gives me, makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, than what we were experiencing during that time. Yeah. Well, and it kind of goes back to that comment you said at the very beginning that it's not always just about us, right? <laughs> no, I, I, it's not I, about me. <laughs> Sometimes it's about those who we have stewardship over our children yeah. or they need something from that. You know, that, that situation took you to St. George where he was able to take that computer class, which impacted the rest of his right, life. I know. So, I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of those mosaics or threads of the tapestry <laughs> that you don't see till years later. <laughs> no, I agree. Now, I know that there's going to be people who are going to want to read your book, and I have to just do a quick plug for Paul's book, Mark and Me. It is the sweetest story of just instances he just plucks out of Mark's life where Mark has taught him a lesson or he's interacted with other people or challenges things to laugh about. And honestly, I was having a morning where I was kind of feeling a little down inside and I picked up your book and I couldn't put it down. I was like, this is the sweetest, bestest book. So if you're having one of those days where you just need to sit back and enjoy a few stories and, and they're beautifully written. And because it's part of Mark's story, you just come to love Mark, even though I've never met Mark. I love Mark. <laughs> you know what I mean? So tell us where we can find your book, Mark. And well, I, I guess the easiest place, Tamara, is, is there's several places, but I guess you could go to Amazon. It's an ebook. It's in paperback and it's in hardback. The book has about 80, little, little over 80 short stories, vignettes um, of what Mark has taught me and what he's taught others. And so it is, it's one of those things where you can read a page or two, or you can read the whole book. So, yeah. And feel inspired. And so I just have to say, thank you so much for coming on, for sharing little bits of your story. I know we, we couldn't dive in super deep, but that's what the book is for, right? <laughs> Before we close, will you please share with us how people can find you and connect with you? There is a website, paultaylorauthor.com. I, I do have a Facebook account, same thing, Paul Taylor Author. An Instagram, Paul Taylor Author. Um, but I'm just, my kids are great on those, but they're all sort of new experiences for me, Tamara. So. <laughs> are you saying Mark is better at Facebook than you? Yes, he, he is far better <laughs> than me. He, I mean, I'm just amazed. And some people tell me they're on Facebook primarily because of Mark. I, I think, wow. But yeah, he's, I can go onto my Facebook account and see people who have commented on Mark's Facebook account. And there's just numbers and numbers and numbers of people who are commenting because Mark has commented. So he's much <laughs> better than I am on Facebook. <laughs> that is so fun. And that's amazing. But thank well, you for sharing, sharing your story and also for being willing to share those experiences with Mark in your book, because they will continue to impact people and he will continue to impact people. And I guess, I think you mentioned this in, in the book, the, the power and influence of one life, you know, that one person can have, you just have no idea, right? That has come to fruition so many times over after those, those mothers back in Chicago. That I would say there's no doubt in my mind that Mark has influenced far more people for good in this life than I have or Susan has or Susan and I combined. And he, Mark is not the only one. His peers, your sons, mm -hmm. they just, they have a gift, okay, that's divine in my mind. It is a divine gift. And he, Mark has a Facebook account. He, here's a young man with Down syndrome, and he has over 800 friends on Facebook. And I'm going, why? <laughs> the Lord blessed me with a great son mm. in Mark. I have two other wonderful sons, three other wonderful daughters. 
but he gave me a, a son with unique gifts. And I think that's one of the other blessings that God has blessed you with is that unique perspective of, of course, God sees everything Mark can and will do and become, but he's blessed you with a father's perspective and love to see your son grow and progress beyond what people ever thought he would originally do and become yeah. right yeah not only what they but what i yeah i mean it was learning for me to see holy mackerel i mean i'm looking back in time saying that look what he has accomplished in his life compared mm -hmm. to where i first saw him or thought of him on the closet floor 30 some odd years ago mm -hmm. it's been quite a journey it has so don't give up hope Trust that God's got this. Have faith. Be still. <laughs> You've given us some amazing lessons. My goodness. Well, thank you, Paul. This has been an honor to have you on today. Thank you for sharing, especially those tender moments when life was hard and you felt God's love. Because well, I think that can get us through just about anything. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, and I appreciate the opportunity to be on this format. You've got quite a following. I think it's really been a privilege for me to be on this with you. So thank you. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, subscribe so you can get your weekly dose of powerful stories of hope. I know there are many of you out there who are going through a hard time, and I hope you found useful things that you can apply to your own life in today's podcast. If you would like to access the show notes of today's show, please visit my website, storiesofhopepodcast.com. There you will find a summary of today's show, the transcript, and one of my favorite takeaways. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this episode with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a quote or a scripture verse that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this podcast. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and He will help you bear the burden. And above all else, remember God loves you.